Now, can you all hear me okay? Or do I need to? I really don't have to give a lesson this morning. So Mike just gave a beautiful lesson on the glory of, of the sun. So let's just all sing another song. We're <laughs> oh. seriously. Our text is John 17, 5, and also John. 17 and 24. We're going to start at verse 4. This is part of the beautiful prayer that Jesus prayed to his Father for his disciples. A prayer of unity, a prayer of protection, and not only a prayer for his disciples, but for those who learned, uh, who heard the word from his disciples. So basically, it's a prayer for all of us. <clears throat> Verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave to me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. So our study today is the study of the glory of the sun. And as I began to study this this uh, subject I thought where do I begin so where I began was what exactly is glory because I never really gave it much thought I know we um, talk about the glory of God we talk about the glory of the Sun but I never really understood or, or gave it much thought what glory is I mean, it's a good thing, obviously, especially when using it to describe anything about God. But I didn't know what glory meant. And what I found out is that glory has many definitions in the Bible. <coughs> in fact, one writer says there are 20 different variations of the word commonly translated as glory. And depending on the context, glory can be used in several different ways. Most of them are associated with ascribing splendor and majesty to God. But glory is also used as a verb, as in to glory in something. So I went to my Strong's Concordance, which is key to the new or to the King James version which is important to know and what I found about the word glory is that yes there are 20 different variations of the word uh, I found 13 in the Old Testament and in the New Testament there were seven more variations of the word glory like I said, the Strong's Concordance is key to the King James Version. And depending on the verse, glory was used in defining any number of things. For example, the word kavod, which is translated into English as glory, basically means splendor. But in Genesis 31 and verse 1, the word is used to describe the wealth that Jacob had gained from his father-in-law Laban. And in Genesis 45, verse 13, the same word is used to define the honor of Joseph in Egypt. Same word, different definition. In the New Testament, the same word is used to describe the splendor of the kings that Satan uh, showed Jesus when he tempted him. 
And that word is used to define the glory of the Father and the Son in, in John 17 and verse 45 in our, in our text. So in one place, the word is translated splendor, and in the other, the word is translated glory. In later translations, such as the New International Version, these words are actually translated as they're meant to be understood, but they're translated from the same words, primarily kabod in Hebrew and doxa in Greek. Well, the point is that glory can be translated in many ways and have various meanings. So what is glory? What does glory mean? Well, the Greek word translated glory in our text, as I said, is doxa. And according to W.E. Vine in his expository of New Testament words, expository, that's a big word. <laughs> anyway, it primarily signifies, this is W.E. Vine speaking, it primarily signifies an opinion or estimate, and hence the honor resulting from a good opinion. It is used for the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation. In other words, what he essentially is and does, as exhibited in whatever way he reveals himself in these respects, and particularly in the person of Christ, in whom essentially his glory has ever shone forth and ever will do. But what does glory mean? Well, like I said, the word has many applications. It means splendor, honor, praise, majesty, magnificence, beauty, brightness, renown, brilliance. It's used for the awesome light that radiates from God's presence and is associated with his acts of power. It's a word that assigns excellence and the highest status to God. Now, any of the words that I just mentioned could be exchanged for the word glory. And any one of them can be used to describe God. Or you could lump them all together and use them to describe the glory of God. And maybe there isn't really a good word to effectively uh, define God's glory. But we use the word glory, the glory of God. Now, can we see God's glory? Is it an entity that can be seen? Well, yes and no. There's a story in Exodus, Exodus 33, uh, speaking of Moses. Now Moses, of course, was leading the Israelites to Canaan, and he was in the habit of pitching a tent outside the uh, encampment of Israel. And whenever he wanted to speak uh, to God, to have a conversation with the Lord, he would go to the tent to talk to him. When Moses went to the tent, the Lord would come down in a pillar of cloud, and then they would talk. Now, was God uh, showing his glory? No. What he was doing was hiding his glory to protect his people from seeing it. Well, this particular instance, Moses was asking, how, asking God how anyone would know that Israel was favored by God if he didn't travel with them. And so God said he would do it. He said... I will do the very thing you have asked me, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses asked God to show him his glory. I don't think I would have done that. I would have been, well, I, I know I wouldn't have done it. But <laughs> Moses wanted to see God, and he was brave enough to ask. And the Lord answered, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. 
I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory passes by. I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. But we don't have to watch the Lord pass by in order to see his glory, do we? I mean, we see God's glory in everything, right? Everywhere you look, if you look, you can see his glory. We see his magnificence and majesty and beauty and splendor in all of his creation. We see it in the majesty of the mountains. We see it in the great expanse of the ocean. We see it in the beauty of a cloud-filled sky on a sunny day. We see it in a rainy day. We see it in the splendor of a of a flower-filled meadow or a forested mountainside or a single flower or a single leaf. We see it in a herd of cattle or a flock of sheep or even in that mosquito that might be buzzing by your, your ear. We see the glory of God. We see it in the intelligence and ingenuity of the human race. We see it in a smile. Well, maybe not my smile, but we see it in a smile. We see it in the birth of a child. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, you can see the glory of God if you look. And if you take the time, you can feel it. You can feel his presence all around you. But even so, with all that creation shows us about the glory of God, nowhere in God's glory is God's glory more apparent than in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's where we see the glory of the Son. That's what Jesus is referring to in John 17 in his prayer to the Father when he says in verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. The Son emptied himself of deity, made himself nothing, lived a sinless life, taught us how to live, performed countless miraculous acts, showing God's power and proving the truth of his word, of his word and his origin. Fulfilling all the messianic prophecies. Jesus' life on earth and all that he did here glorified God. Every aspect of Jesus' life brought glory to God. He did everything that was asked of him. His life here on earth was lived in obedience to God, out of love for him and love for mankind. Nothing, nothing can illustrate God's glory better than the son here, son's life here on earth. Nothing, nothing is more glorious than that. But maybe that's not true. There is something at least as glorious and maybe more glorious than that. I would say that the reuniting of the Father and the Son at the throne of heaven is at least as glorious and maybe more glorious than the life that Jesus lived here on earth. In verse 5 Jesus of, of uh, chapter 17, Jesus says, I have brought you glory. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. But in order for that to happen, the son had to do one more thing. He had to complete the final act of sacrifice in giving his life for our worthless lives. At, uh, shedding his blood to put in motion God's promise of redemption. And three days later, he showed Satan he had the power to conquer death, showing him that sin and death couldn't hold him, and so offering to mankind the promise of eternal life, the completion of Elohim's plan to reunite us with him in Christ. 
That's the greatest example of God's glory. But this is supposed to be a lesson about the glory of, of the Son, isn't it? And it is. Because the Father's glory is portrayed in the Son's glory and how he lived his life. God's glory is wrapped up in his love for his creation. As I said, we see it everywhere we look. And we see it in the plan of salvation for mankind. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The glory of the Son is wrapped up in his love for man as well. His whole life was lived in, to bring about the redemption of man. Everything that Jesus did was for us. His life lived, his life given, shedding of his blood, resurrected. All things were done for us. Now, of course, the glory of the Son is illustrated in his life as seen in the Gospels. That's how we learn of him. That's how we learn of his teaching, the power of the Holy Spirit working through him. That's how we see his glory, by uh, reading the word. But the writer of Hebrews gives us some illustrations of the Son's glories in the first uh, few verses of the Hebrew letter. A kind of overview of the life of Christ. It reads there, starting at verse 1, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many, as many times and in very various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir, heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So first, the writer says, at one time God spoke to mankind through various prophets, but now he speaks through his son, Jesus Christ. What greater glory is there than to be called the son of God by God? How amazing that must be. Well, twice in the gospel account, speaking of Jesus, the father said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. The father glorified Jesus by acknowledging him as his son. The first time was at Jesus' baptism, indicating, I believe, it was now time to follow Jesus, not the law, not the prophets, but Jesus. The second time he called Jesus his son was on the mountain where Jesus was transfigured. I would have loved to have seen that, like Peter and James and John saw it. How amazing that would, would have been to see the glory of the sun, his face shining like the sun and his clothes as bright as light. You remember that while he and Peter and James and John were on the mountain, Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus. And Peter wanted to set up uh, three shelters for all of them. At that time, God in a cloud declared that Jesus is his beloved son and that he was pleased with him. And then he added, listen to him. In other words, though God had spoken through the law and the prophets in the past, it was time to listen to the teaching of Jesus Christ, God's son, the fulfillment of the law and prophets. Just like the writer of Hebrews is saying in these verses. Now he speaks through his son. So we see the glory in Jesus' words and in God calling Jesus his son. We see the glory of the son in his inheritance. Jesus is God's son who was appointed heir of all things. In other words, all that is the father's is the sons from before creation it was part of the plan that was put in place that Jesus 
would be the heir of all things. As the word, he was part of the Godhead and shared in the glory of the Godhead. But when he emptied himself of deity, he became wholly human. He became Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. He lived here on earth, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he taught the word of the Father, doing only his will, performing wondrous miracles to prove he was sent from the Father. He fulfilled his purpose. He completed his mission. He redeemed man by dying on the cross and defeating death by rising from the grave. And 40 days later, he ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, to claim his inheritance. All things, all creation, all authority over all people, all that is the Father's is the Son's. Jesus is the heir to the Father. The Son's glory is seen in creation. As the Word, he was an integral part of creating all things. It was through him that the universe was created and through the word that all things are sustained. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. One writer explains it this way. <coughs> Before his humble entrance onto the stage of universal history as the son of man, Jesus was and is and ever shall be. From all eternity and into the ages that are to come, Jesus is the dazzling brightness of God's glorious magnificence, the essential blazing radiance of his resplendent glory. God's glory is Jesus' glory. He's the exact representation of God. In other words, God is represented in everything we know about Jesus Christ. When you know Jesus, you know God. The, the Son's glory is seen in the redemption of mankind, the purification for sins, allowing us to have a relationship with the Father. We honor, we praise Him, and we thank Him for taking our sins upon Himself. We glorify Him for shedding His blood and washing away our sins. And now He sits at the right hand of the Father, glorified alongside the Father, given the glory He had with Him, before the world began, from before the world began. So what now? How does the world see the glory of the sun today? And the answer is, his glory is seen through how we live our lives as members of his body, the church. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So how we live as part of the body of Christ demonstrates the glory of God, of the Son, both individually and collectively as a body. If we want the world to see the glory of the Son today, our lives have to be lived as he lived. We have to live by faith in the Son of God, believing that our old man is dead. Now, Christ lives in us. And his glory is seen in us by how we live. And we live in Christ. When we no longer live in sin, but live in Christ, love takes over how we live. And we take to heart the two greatest commandments. Love God, love man. And if we can do that, if we can love God and love man in our lives, this world will see in us the glory of God in the glory of the Son. And then the words of the second verse of our text, John 17 and 24, will come true for us. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. 
I love the prayer of chapter 17. Because not only is it for his first disciples, but it's also, as I said before, for those who follow him. He's talking about us. He's talking about being united. He's talking about uh, protection from the evil one in that, in that chapter. He's talking about us being united one with another in the body. And he talks about us being with him as God glorifies him there in heaven. He says, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. I want to be there with him too. I want to see the glory of the Father and the Son there in heaven. I want to be a part of that. And that's the lesson. I hope I said something in my short talk that gave you something to think about. And if we want to close the service without offering an invitation, if there's somebody here who would like the prayers of the brothers here, please come as we stand and sing.